Thank you, Ray. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, today, again, I'd like to talk about radiolysis during liquid cell electron microscopy. But before that, I'd like to thank all the people who helped me with this project and also our funding agency, the National Science Foundation. We are very familiar with liquid cells. We use a homebrew device created by Grogan and Bow at the University of Pennsylvania that we call the Nano Aquarium. And this is a completely sealed device that's bonded using wafer bonding and standard lithography techniques. We also have electrodes for sensing and probing, which we won't need to describe the radiolysis, but it can be used in conjunction with the beam effects that we see. So when we first created this device, we wanted to make sure that we could actually see something. The first system we looked at, uh, Joe Grogan looked at five nanometer gold particles in solution. And much to our enjoyment, we were able to find that we could see classical diffusion limit aggregation of these gold nanoparticles. We didn't know exactly why they were aggregating at the time, because they should be charge stabilized particles. Uh, but we did notice that the aggregation, no matter what was causing it, was as you would expect for diffusion limited aggregation. So we ask, why do these otherwise stable particles aggregate? Well, coincidentally, we are exposing our sample to a large amount of radiation. In this case, it's the electron beam. And today I'd like to talk about what this electron beam is doing to our aqueous solution. So whenever you have any type of ionizing radiation, this can be electrons, this can be photons, it can be heavy ions, and you put it into water, you'll have interactions with the water molecules. The ones we're most going to care about are the ionization events. So anytime any type of radiation ionizes water, you will have a free electron and an uh, H2O plus ion in solution. And in the very early phases, starting from say 10 to the negative 16 seconds, you're going to have two pathways that follow. One, the um, water ion is going to start interacting with other water ions to start creating species. And then eventually the uh, electrons, they're going to interact with the water and they will end up getting a cage of water around them where they become hydrated electrons or aqueous electrons. And as this happens, it happens in a very inhomogeneous way and you'll basically have what is called a spur, which is a, uh, cylindri a either a cylindrical volume or a spherical volume that is growing in space and time. But by the time you reach 10 to the negative 6 seconds, the inhomogeneity in that region has died out, and now you have a pretty consistent distribution of your initial primary yield. And that's what we have at about 10 to the negative 7 seconds here. If you want to know what happens beyond this time, slower reactions occur, and you have to account for these reactions through many kinetic systems. In the early times, you can really describe the neat water spur reactions by about 10 reactions. But by the time you get to anything beyond this microsecond, you're going to need dozens of reactions in order to fully account for the recombination of water. Today I want to talk about a model in these later times because as microscopists, what we care about are experiments on the order of seconds, tens of seconds, and hours, not what's happening in these time ranges that when it comes to our temporal resolution we can't even see yet. The way we're going to do this is we're going to use a reaction diffusion model. By the diffusion part of this is outside of the beam region, because many of our cells, we only irradiate a small area of them. And then there's a, the terms, your, any given species is going to be consumed through its kinetic reactions, and it's also going to be produced potentially by some kinetic reactions. The final term is these initial for, uh, formations during the spurs, and this is just a production term that we're going to model all that early time stuff using a simple value called the G value. And this is just the number of molecules of any given species that has been created or destroyed uh, for every 100 electron volts deposited into the material. So when we run these simulations, we can get the graph on the left. Here we're looking at typical TEM conditions where we have a 1 micron beam radius and a beam uh, current of about a, of a nanometer. And when we let this evolve temporally, we'll see that very quickly Within a few milliseconds, if we irradiate the whole volume, so this is we're imagining that we have a fully irradiated cell, we get to a steady state of every species. And we notice that if we do this for many, many different dose rates, uh, which a dose is just the amount of energy absorbed per kilogram per second in the material of energy from the incident radiation, we can see that we always establish a steady state for the range that's available to electron microscopy, which is, say, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 10. Sometimes you can get a little bit higher in stems. You can probably go up to about 10 to the 12th grays per second. Uh, the reason I showed these lower dose rates because uh, other, this field of radiation chemistry is well developed in many other regions, such as medical imaging and in nuclear reactors. 
When you go and get an x-ray, you're going to be receiving grays per hour, and you'll end up being in that closer to the 10 to the negative 2 grays per second. So that's what's studied for medical imaging. And nuclear reactors can go up to about 10 to the third grays per second. So we, with, this, with our devices of liquid cell electron microscopy, really can access much higher dose rates than when what's studied in previously. And this is really interesting because not only can we use this as an imaging technique, but we can use it as a, as a platform for imaging radiation chemistry itself. And so all these species interact differently. And I want to show two, just two species here spatially what happens. So the grayed out area is the electron beam. So here we're irradiating a one micron beam area, or beam radius, in a 50 micron cell. And we're looking at the evolution of two species in time. Hydrogen is the most well-behaved species of, every, of all of them, of all 16 species. And what happens with hydrogen is it's very a very diffusive process. Quickly, within milliseconds, you get up to about half of its steady state concentration. But then you have to wait for the whole cell to be filled due to diffusion before you'll reach the final steady state value. I define steady state as 95% of 95% uh, of its final long time value in the simulations. Hydrated electrons, on the other hand, are the most reactive species. They're very strong reducers. They really want to react as soon as possible. And they have a very interesting behavior because first they will peak in early times, but then as other species come online, such as oxygen, which is the main consumer in the cell of these, of these systems of hydrated electrons, begin to increase in their concentration. It comes down to its final steady state. Outside of the beam, however, since it's so reactive, it only persists for a couple hundred nanometers outside of the beam region. And this is something that we can exploit. Every other species in the system will have some behavior that's in between these two. So again, we ask this question, why do these other otherwise stabilized particles aggregate? Uh, well, these are charge stabilized particles, so we came up with two hypotheses. One, because we are creating many ionic species in solution, we could be changing the Debye length, the screening length of these particles. We ran the numbers, and the change is only for these, um, lecture, these conditions is only about 10% change in Debye length, so that's probably not destabilizing them. So the other option is that since these are, again, charge stabilized particles, maybe changes in pH can cause a, the particles to go closer to their isoelectric point, making them unstable. And that seems to be the case where we can drop the, uh, these particles by changing the pH much closer to being unstable. And we see that for a pH 7 solution initially, if we irradiate it with the dose rate for these beam conditions, we actually drop, within the beam region, the pH to 4.5. So within your beam region especially, there are going to be very, very strong changes in the pH of your solution. And notice that it's always towards the acidic. So if you have a very basic solution, you're going to be changing in, again, electron microscopy is probably 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 10th range. You're going to be changing very significantly your pH. If you're working in an acidic solution, you're probably going to be OK if you're working in, say, a uh, sulfuric acid solution where your pH is 2, you're probably not changing your pH too much. But it's very important to consider these beam effects even outside of the, the standard deposition and etching that we've been seeing. So what other observed phenomena are there? Well, there are many, but I wanted to focus on one very interesting process that we noticed, and that was the etching of gold nanoparticles. <laughs> these nanoparticles were provided by the Chris Murray group at Penn, and they're nice uh, nano rods. And we noticed that as we're imaging them, they started dissolving. And so we wanted to understand this a little bit better. And so in our solution, there are two species that are important for the dissolution and the growth of nanoparticles. Hydrated electrons are very strong reducers. They're going to cause our whatever metallic particle you have to be reduced and grow in the nanocrystal. But we also have very strong oxidizing agents, <coughs> such as OH radicals. And if we look at, say, the steady state concentration of these, the ratio of these two species, we can see in the bottom left that there's a non-monotonic relationship. So presumably, for, say, the growth of a nanoparticle, there's some threshold number of electrons you need in order to fully reduce your solution. And then after that point, you can have growth. But given the right systems and the right beam conditions, you can have two other states that exist, such as the etching of particles, which we saw in the previous video, and we show in the left column here, or particles that are completely stable under the beam conditions. They'll be stable under lower beam conditions as well, but you can find an in-between zone between etching and growth if you need that extra contrast where the particles stay stable. And that's what we see in the, medium, uh, the middle column. And then if you go to the much higher dose rates, you can begin to grow your nanocrystals, as, been, as has been well shown uh, in many studies.
if I just take a bunch of these experiments and plot them, where anything below the horizontal line in the top left is etching, anything on the line is a stable particle, anything above, we can see qualitatively that these experiments agree very well with this idea that we have a non-monotonic relationship between the ratio of steady state concentrations. We don't know the reaction rates, unfortunately, with gold for these species, all of the ones that we need. So that's why we just look at the ratio of concentrations. But if you knew the reaction rates, presumably you could explicitly, quantitatively, uh, figure out what is going on between these two different sets of reactions. Uh, one thing, again, that I wanted to point out is we can now exploit these different properties. We know we can either cause etching or growth. So say we want to cause growth because we're very interested in nanocrystals. And we also know that hydrated electrons don't persist too far outside the beam. So we can ex uh, exploit this. We see on the right here a new graph, which is just the time evolution of the middle of the, the, middle of the beam, the edge of the beam, and the far wall. And we see that we always stay at essentially zero concentration at the wall and the beam edge and center have their values that first spike and come back down. This is the behavior I described earlier. So we can use this and exploit it where uh, Grogan et al, what they did is they went and we were able to write the names of Penn and IBM using a just a pure gold chloride solution and the beam. In the stem, what we do is we zoom in to increase the dose rate because the dose rate is, the, again, the amount of energy deposited. Uh, you have to take into account the area that you're depositing the energy over. So when you zoom in, you increase the dose rate and we were able to zoom in and draw these lines so that we could get these patterned nanowires. But you can imagine you can extend this to uh, other systems depending on what type of crystals you want to grow. So that today I showed you that we have this very nice kinetic model that helps us quantitatively understand what's happening during liquid cell electron microscopy due to the interaction of the electron beam and the solution. And then we looked at a couple applications therein. So at this point I'd like to take any questions.